Okay, cool. Um, so I guess, hello everyone and welcome to the talk of Riding the Tailwind of NLP Explosion. I am Rong Yao. I am data scientist at CB Insights. Um, I work on the R&D team over there and we're embedded in the engineering org. It's pretty compact under 10 people and we're tasked with developing end-to-end -end data science solutions for the company. Before um, I go into the details, I just wanted to share a bit more about CB Insights because it provides background for the work that I will be sharing. So CB Insight is a technology insight platform um, that offers data and expert intel across industries. You might have seen one of our market maps or reports on state of venture or unicorn boards. We also have a pretty popular newsletter uh, that it's free that offers you some occasional black humor of uh, bad data visualizations. Um, at CBI, we ingest over 2 million documents monthly, and that provides a very interesting playground for developing NLP capabilities. And our R&D team's work is heavily focused on NLP for that reason. As a compact uh, R&D team, I think we really benefited from the uh, explosion of development in the field of NLP in the past four years. Um, and that is what I wanted to share today with you. First, I wanted to invite you to look back on the past decades NLP evolution, especially focusing on what happened since uh, 2018 with attention and transformers. And then we're gonna um, look at uh, our journey at CBI of how we leveraged these new techniques to modernize our NLP stack. And finally, we wanted to also share some very concrete uh, real challenges that we ran into using transformers and some strategies that we come up with. Um, I will be monitoring the uh, Q&A channel, uh, but maybe I can only get to them at the end of the session. I'll try to leave around 10 minutes for that. Okay, so without further delay, let's get started. First of all, I um, wanted to pose a big question. Uh, what, is, what is NLP? Right? What is the field concerned with? In my opinion, uh, NLP is a field that try to enable machine to understand and uh, use human language. And that starts with the problem of representation. As you hear me talk, you read the slides, information gets encoded into your brain, which becomes useful later. So how do we enable machine to do the same in a vector space so that the space would capture syntactic, semantic um, information, as well as complex relationship among concepts? Really, if you look at NLP from prehistoric time to the Bronze Age, you will realize that we've traveled a long way. In terms of representation, we started with um, a simple bag of words, right? Where any sequence of text or documents is represented as a orderless bag of words. And the words here are just, you know, word tokens in the, in the, for example, English vocab. This is a extremely high dimensional space, uh, very sparse. If you look at the example document, the dog is on the table um, and we see what's present in this document is highlighted in green, right? And, and the, the remaining ones in the vocab, which is vast majority of them, is in gray. So um, this is what, where we start with. Fast forward into 2013, we enter the stone age of, of NLP, where we're no longer looking at isolated and um, independent word tokens in a vector space we're looking at distributed representation. And what that means is you're now representing a word by its context. Even though word to vac and doc to vac are often just single layer neural net, you started to see interesting things in the vector space that it's capturing, such as the male-female relationship and a verb tense relationship. 
that's still uh, pretty amazing to me. But just to wait, now we enter the Bronze Age um, since 2018, we've seen the distributed representation evolve even further into um, a very deep distributed representation and also a context aware representation use neural language models. Here is uh, a zoomed in version of what happened after 2018, a timeline of the birth of uh, what I call supermodels. Um, it, the breakthrough really happened in October 2018 when Google released the BERT. Um, as compared to its predecessors, BERT uses the attention mechanism and is trained in a self-supervised fashion. So compared to LSTM, what is new in BERT, um, I will cover that in a little bit more detail later, is number one, instead of sequentially encoding information, which suffers from you know, a slowness, long range disk dependency issue, vanishing or exploding gradients, attention is able to encode information in parallel and alleviate these problems. Second, BERT uses self-supervised training, which basically unlocked the whole internet as its learning corpus. Starting from there, you see um, a rapid uh, iterations of, of, of innovations on top of attention uh, and BERT. So on the techniques level, for example, you see uh, token optimization. We go from like DPE, like uh, byte pair encoding in BERT, uh, into sentence piece encoding. We see training optimization. We see uh, cross model, like going from solely purely NLP into NLP and vision cross model, uh, vision language pre-training, as we see in DALI and CLIP. And then we see techniques such as MOE, sparse activation, pathways, uh, training. We see multi-model and multi-task in GATO, the generalist agent model that made a big splash uh, this year. And also one uh, big overall theme this year in particular has been uh, text to image and text to video. Um, and if we decompose that, that's basically um, natural language understanding through transformer language model plus diffusion, right? And if you compare video to image, it's just adding a temporal uh, dimension onto image. So um, it's, it's really crowded what, what has happened since uh, 2018. And if we zoom out a little bit, you will be able to see a paradigm shift from before the, uh, the Browns age, fully supervised learning is the, the way to go, right? And honestly, uh, that sets a really high bar for um, most practitioners and teams to even use deep neural networks. Because if you're to train a neural network from scratch with millions of parameters, you'd have to have a lot of label data. But when BERT came, it, it changed that. It came with its pre-trained weights. So now the paradigm have shifted from end-to-end -end fully supervised to pre-trained and fine-tuned. And the difference here is you only need sometimes a couple thousand or even a couple hundred data points for your task to, to be able to get a good performance because you're writing on the pre-trained weights. Um, if you look at a timeline where GPT-3 stands, uh, in 2020 is when we get the first hint of zero shot or few shot learning. And what that means is you don't even fine tune the model itself. Now the paradigm is pre-train, prompt, and predict. We're saying that by training the model on um, a huge volume of data and very diverse uh, data, the model already knows so much that you just need to know the right way to probe its knowledge and use it for your downstream task. So here we talked about the paradigm shift. And if you zoom out even further, you will be able to see um, three directions that we're progressing along. On one hand, we are scaling up 
right? From birds, we're talking about hundreds of millions, and then we go into the billions and even trillions. We're talking about increasing generalizability, starting with you know, single language to multilingual to language and vision cross model to uh, where, where ghetto is, like where everything is sequence to sequence and you can even uh, teach the model to play Atari games. And the third direction is more efficient training, fine tuning, prompting and inference. Now, allow me to highlight again, uh, really behind the prosperity of Brown Sage are these three pillars. Attention uh, is essentially efficient parallel encoding of information as compared to sequential encoding. Self-supervision is, um, for example, in masked language uh, pre-training, you are randomly masking tokens in a sequence and by recovering that token, the, the model actually learned some fundamental aspect of, of human language. A good, I think a good analogy for these two pillars will be that I have taught my five-year-old to read. Okay? Uh, once he starts reading, he's able to um, unlock a, a whole library of, of knowledge himself. And with attention, he's not only reading one token at a time in a sequential manner, but he's gobbling up whole paragraphs. The third pillar is the empirical scaling law as uh, found in a study that um, it favors scaling up the model size given more computational power. In fact, uh, if you scale the model size six degrees of magnitude, you only need to increase your, your data magnitude by, by two. And there is a good analogy for, uh, for that in, a, in biology too. If you look at uh, different species, starting from a basic roundworm, right? The, the C. allegan, the famously studied C. allegan with just 302 neurons to human beings with uh, 86 billion neurons. You definitely see the level up of, of intelligence here. Um, indeed, we have seen so much progress, I think over the past four years that um, some researcher got so excited as to claim that it is all about scale now. Uh, we see this interesting battle between uh, this uh, DeepMind researcher and, and Gary Marcus, uh, who's a professor at NYU, a scientist and psychology professor. So Nando uh, from DeepMind, uh, after the release of, of Gato, the generalist agent, um, can't hide its excitement and says, it's all about skill now, the game is over. It's about making these models bigger, safer, compute efficient, blah, blah, blah. And that announcement is, is quickly refuted by, by Gary Marcus in this uh, blog post called The New Science of Out Intelligence. Um, and here is an excerpt from it. It says billions of dollars have been poured into transformers, training data sets expanded from megabytes to gigabytes, parameters from millions to trillions. And yet the discomprehending errors well documented in numerous works since 1988 remain. And here on the slides on the, on the rightmost side is such an example of this comprehending error made by an amazing supermodel. Uh, I believe this is the, the Flamingo model, the, the language vision uh, model, and a conversation between uh, the researcher uh, and the model. So the model sees uh, a picture of three dots. Uh, this is a traffic light, it is red, the model says. Can you see three circles? Yes, I can see three circles. What colors are they? They're red, blue, and green. Mm. Where is the green circle? Uh, the green circle is on the right. Really, on the right of what? The green circle is on the right of the blue circle. So here we see that um, even though these large supermodels can do amazing things, they seem to fail at reliable common sense recently. So that indicates a problem, right? Indeed, uh, a lot of researchers have been um, 
thinking about that, and they're they're pushing new frontiers in the field of NLP and AI in general. And here are uh, three researchers and, and their work. Um, the first one is uh, Ye Jing Choi, and her work focuses on common sense reasoning. And here is a talk that she gave at uh, ACL conference this year, which highlights redirections in future NLP research. It's about embracing the ambiguous aspect of language, about exploring the continuum across language, knowledge, and reasoning. And it's about banding symbolic and neural knowledge representation together. Um, and we know uh, as a fact that the symbolic aspect has been missing from all these years of, of deep, deep learning advancement and NLP advancement. The famous Yang LeCun um, published a paper about uh, a path towards autonomous machine intelligence, where he laid out a, a system of modularized interfacing differentiating modules that can be trained in a self-supervised fashion. Here, uh, I think the highlight for me is that uh, we see word models there, which is uh, important for, for common sense reasoning. And we see a highlight of planning under uncertainty using word models. And then the third scholar is, um, is Feifei, Feifei Li, um, the, the mother of ImageNet and a lot of uh, advancement in computer vision. In 2021, she pivoted to pivoted from static computer vision to uh, what she calls active or proactive computer vision. And the core idea here is that learning through interaction with an environment is always faster than learning from static input. Um, she has worked with other researchers on a benchmark data set, just like ImageNet, but um, called behavior that include a hundred human-like activities in virtual worlds. So this new um, area of focus is basically building um, AI agent, uh, they call it embodied intelligence, that is able to interact with these 3D visual worlds and learn knowledge from it. And indeed, their early research have already found that um, there are a lot fewer neurons that are activated in these embodied agents as compared to uh, a network that's trained on static input. So all of these are like very exciting uh, big pictures and, and, and frontiers, which might seem a little bit far away. <laughs> in the next section, I would want to share um, our journey at CBI of how we uh, modernized our NLP tech stack using these latest advancements in NLP. Okay, I've seen there are some questions. Ah, okay, uh, I, slides. Yeah, I'm more than happy to share the, the slides uh, and, and the long list of research papers behind <laughs> the timeline of supermodels with you. And feel free to ping me on LinkedIn or, or email me directly. Okay, now uh, coming back to, to the ground, how do we make those things useful? So when we started at CBI, uh, I think NLP is still in prehistoric time where you know the, the bag of words uh, walk the earth. And if you look at the pipeline of our, um, if you look at our NLP pipeline, you will see that it kind of, it's like a canyon rock that reflects the NLP evolution. So the pipeline starts with raw text data ingestion. And here at CBI, we ingest very diverse um, text documents like news, organization failings, research, press, patents. And then all of that will go through a standard processing pipeline um, of filtering, tokenization, MP extraction, so on and so forth. And finally, it stands out into the NLP application layer. Here on the right of the diagram, I have listed um, techniques and the tools and libraries to use for each part of the pipeline. And we see that the 
uh, upstream on like the standard processing pipeline, it's kind of like a like a crocodile, prehistoric time crocodile, where you see a lot of um, bag of tricks for NLP, such as stop words, regex rules. And it is at the NLP application layer that uh, really the latest in innovation started to sip in. So here we used uh, transformers in uh, either the fine tuning or the zero shot capacity. We use the libraries such as Hugging Face Transformers, PyTorch Lightning, and I will share a um, our toolbox in, in a bit of, of what has been added uh, due to the latest advancement in NLP. And here is a timeline of transformer applications uh, that we, we've done at CBI. It started in late 2018, so when, when Google released, released BERT, we did a quick hack day uh, project with that, with very little expectation, but it certainly has beat our expectation. And we started to think seriously of making it useful. From there, it took us a, a full year to do our first production release. And from there, um, a couple more months, we had our second production release. We built up our internal library on top of Hugging Face and PyTorch Lightning. So um, we do some uh, basic automation for using Transformer in, in more applications. And from there, we kind of tried different things. Uh, we tried NER, we used the multi-stage transfer, we tried the zero shot, we dealt with the long document uh, limitation in Transformers, uh, we tried QA, multilingual models, and our recent work has been focusing on key phrase extraction, representation learning, and understanding what these large language models are doing. If we reflect on this, this, this timeline of how the modernization has happened, I think there are a couple of tips I wanted to share. The first one is experiment downstream and propagate upstream. Um, and this is uh, talking from like a highly practical perspective. If you are enterprise R&D team, um, always it's a tougher sell to do uh, something that's a incremental efficiency and has a lot of dependencies, which is if you want to use a new technology for some upstream pipeline. But down there at the application layer, uh, we're talking about isolated projects that has very little dependencies. So if you are able to experiment fast uh, downstream, and once you have accumulated enough knowledge and confidence, you can propagate the innovation upstream, then that will be much easier. The second one uh, is invest in test harness and performance benchmarks. Um, I think these two are like the most underrated uh, in, in, in the data science and most of the places I have worked with because um, face to choose who loves data curation, right? It's, it's very mundane. However, that is usually the first roadblock when you're talking about continuously improving ML projects. If your trained test staff set are tucked away, if your um, performance metrics are poorly documented, um, it's going to be very difficult to try a new thing on an existing working pipeline. And if you look at what's happening in like academia and AI, this is exactly the trend too, an emphasis on data benchmarks. Um, so yeah, definitely invest time in building up test harness and performance benchmarks for your project. The third one is uh, phased transition and post deployment monitoring. At CBI, we have um, some very bread and butter pipeline uh, for ingesting funding news, for example. And changing, making a small change in that pipeline is going to cause a, a big effect. So even if at the research phase, you're super confident about the result, we still wanted to do phase transition, have human in the loop, validate the result, and move forward from there. And the last tip is learning fast and learning slow. Here, 
uh, what I mean by learning fast is don't be afraid to do quick and dirty, you know, Google Colab experiments. Just that's what we did uh, with BERT in, in 2018. But also uh, we need to learn slow by really studying the fundamentals of this new technology and propagate the knowledge among the team. And that's how we're able to build up and move from a simple proof of concept to some really useful applications. Okay, so that is um, NLP stack modernization on a high level. While doing all of those experiments, we run into a lot of challenges. Some of the challenge were able to come up with strategies uh, to, to fix them. Some of them were still very puzzled about. So I'm going to talk about those next. If you share the same challenges with us, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. We'd love to um, discuss. Here is our open source toolbox surrounding uh, using transformers. Uh, we started using Hugging Face in 2019. Back then, they're just a repository of, you know, PyTorch transformer uh, architecture and pre-trained weights. But now they have uh, grown into an entire AI community with um, a code base of the trainer, the inference pipeline, a model hub, and a, a lot more. So that is definitely one important tool we, we use. Uh, PyTorch Lightning is a, a very useful research framework that help us to get rid of a lot of the boilerplate. And it gives you uh, bells and whistles, like if you wanted to do some fancy training uh, techniques, you want to do mixed precision, you wanted to do uh, a gradient accumulation, all of that, you don't need to write your own code. It's already automated uh, in Lightning. So, a uh, huge uh, or a huge fan of, of that too. Um, data uh, model monitoring, experiment monitoring. We use different things here and we haven't settled on one. Uh, we tried weights and biases and ML flow and the basic tensor board. Um, all have, uh, I, I would say all are working um, and the, uh, we, we haven't settled on a single one. Um, this year, we also experimented with some explainability tool. We're just getting into them. Uh, the Captain and the Language Interpretability tool, which allows us to peek inside the model and see why it's making certain decisions. Uh, we also use Streamlit. I think it's a extremely uh, useful tool when you want to do, to do human review uh, of certain data set or model or you wanted to do a in-house proof of concept to users outside of your team. Um, we also love Streamlit. So with these newly added tools, um, it really have ingested new blood into our practical R&D lifecycle at CBI. It starts with problem solution mapping, and then, um, success criteria, identifying success criteria and test harness. Then it's building the baseline and proof of concept. And then it's running iterations on them. And finally it goes into production. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the challenges that we met with when running iterations, because usually the, the tough bit is not uh, coming up with a baseline, but rather how do you improve it to the point that's it good enough for your, for your business use case. Here are two examples of our uh, NLP pipeline uh, that has multiple transformers in them. This is a founding extraction pipeline where what we're doing is given a news article, we first identify whether it is, uh, whether it contains founding information. If it does, then we go ahead and extract what company raised the money, from which investor, how much it raised, what is the round type. And then after that, there are entity resolution as well. So here we are uh, mostly fine tuning transformers. Here's another example of uh, extracting customer references uh, done by my brilliant uh, colleagues. 
uh, what we're doing here is uh, classify again news articles of whether they contain business relationship. We extract those relationship and we further identify uh, customer quotes uh, and who said that. And we surface that on our platform too. If we look at, if we classify our uh, applications into fine tuning and the zero shotting, here are uh, bits of information about what models uh, we've worked with. In terms of fine tuning, we've worked with Roberta, uh, XML Roberta, which is multilingual, and BART, and they're in the from 100 to 800 million parameter range. And you can see that in terms of how much data we use to fine tune it, it actually varies a lot. Sometimes it, it's in the hundreds, and sometimes it goes up to 100,000. For zero shot, we've uh, fiddled with T5 and BART, and some of the example problems are you know, classified news topics, we use embedding as features, and key phrase extraction. Now, if we group the challenges um, into categories, here are uh, what they look like. We've run into data challenges when going beyond the POC. We often see data challenges. Uh, we see training and zero shot challenges. Uh, we have come up with our own pipeline strategies, which is basically when one single supermodel is not enough, what do you do? And then the explainability uh, component, which is important for both diagnosis and external adoption, because we're talking about how can people trust the result of an algorithm. So let's dive into some details of each of these. Small training set. Um, as, we, as I shared in the example slide before, some of our uh, classification problems, we only have around a uh, you know, couple hundreds or couple thousand training data. So that is very little. How do we uh, improve your training performance? Here are a couple of strategies. In NLP, a typical technique is translation augmentation, uh, which is basically if you're talking about a minority language, uh, let's say uh, uh, Thai, and uh, you have a lot of English training data, what do you do? You only have limited Thai data. What you can do is translate your English uh, into Thai and then use that for training. So that's translation augmentation. The other two techniques are what I call hierarchical labeling and cross-lingual transfer. Let me uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. In my opinion, they are both transfer on top of transfer. So in the case of hierarchical labeling, that is when your labels have inherent hierarchical structure. Right? And in this case, you can arrange them into almost like an inverse pyramid and transfer from the widest to the narrowest. Let's say you have a label on, you know, this article is, is financial news or business news. You have a lot of labels around that. But you only have limited labels of this is actually talking about an MA deal or a series A deal. So you can actually leverage the more labels that you have on, on higher funnel, the, the news is about uh, business and financial, you can train a model, use that pre-trained model, and then fine tune it on the downstream task of identifying M&A deals. So that is an example of uh, hierarchical labels. And how do you um, uh, alleviate the, the small training set problem? The second, oops, sorry, can I go back? Yes. The second technique is called the cross-lingual transfer. And that is something particularly interesting when we've trained a multilingual model uh, that is able to handle 100 different languages. Here, we are observing a positive transfer from the model learning from a, a language that has very abundant training data to a low resource language. Uh, still using the, the founding example. It, we have a lot of founding news in English, but not that many in Thai. 
So we found that if we train the multilingual model in mixed language, but use a deaf set for the target language, it actually greatly improves that minority language's performance. So this is cross-lingual transfer. Some other data challenges are, uh, for example, label imbalance, which is pretty common. Um, what I found useful um, as a training technique is uh, you do upsample and downweight for each of the batch. The intuition behind it is you wanted the model to see a good representation of all labels in each batch. So the gradient is actually uh, good enough. But at the same time, you wanted to downweight uh, after you upsample because you want to capture the real world uh, distribution of your labels. We've also run into problems of uh, long document. We know most of these uh, language models have limitation on sequence length. Um, sometimes it's 512, maybe 1024. Um, my wonderful colleague worked on uh, text condensation. Um, so before you feed the document into uh, the language model, you actually use techniques to condense the content uh, to make it fit into the, the length limitation. There's a the, the blog post that she wrote about it, which I can share um, later. We also tried a different pipeline strategies. And this is uh, what I mentioned earlier. When a single supermodel doesn't solve your problem, then sometimes you can uh, look for solutions in a hybrid system. And here is uh, my apologies for the, for the small uh, pictures, but it's a system where we have uh, transformer models working side by side with rules to identify six plus, 60 plus categories of founding rounds um, for founding use. And you can also do pre and post processing in the pipeline uh, so that, for example, when dealing with zero shot models, it often outputs a lot of noise. You can find ways to clean them up and still make them very useful. Here are um, finally two challenges that um, uh, I feel like we're still puzzled with. The first one is under the pre-train prompt predict paradigm. How do we come up with good prompt, right? And we've noticed in our experiment that these prompt, uh, the model is very sensitive to the prompt, uh, whereas a human will never, if you answer, uh, ask a question in this way or that way, a human will answer the same, but the model does not. So in one of our projects, we had to uh, put multiple versions of prompt and then uh, kind of ensemble the result together. But there are um, some recent work this year published, uh, a GitHub library called Open Prompt, which is just for prompt learning. Uh, we haven't tried that yet, uh, but maybe it uh, offers some interesting techniques there for better utilizing zero shot. And the second challenge, uh, which we're also still puzzled with, is the explainability aspect of the models. Um, talking about the two popular libraries that my colleague tried, Captain and, and Lit, we found that um, if you look at the results given by different method, they don't always agree with each other. And as a matter of fact, there's no ground truth method for understanding model behavior, because all of these are only capturing one aspect of what the model is doing. And if you're talking about SHAP and LIME, they even use uh, surrogate models that try to mimic the real model's behavior. Um, so how do we come up with a good explanation for, for the model prediction? Oftentimes comes down to, you know, a ground truth data set that is labeled by human and how well your method, uh, your automated method align with those human intuition. Okay, so those are the um, concrete challenges that we, that we run into while uh, experimenting with transformer models. I also have a, uh, a little bit of a bonus section here, which I'm going to probably skip. 
um, to leave some time for, for questions. Um, let's see. Hello, everyone. And I wanted to give shout outs to my fantastic colleagues at CBI R&D and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.